Jason Wamsgans is a star photographer at the Chicago Tribune and a 2017 Pulitzer Prize winner. He's been documenting the impact of Chicago's gun violence for more than five years, and his demystifying media talk focuses on that issue. It's a little different from most of our videos. In this instance, we had the lights turned down low and let Jason's photographs, as well as his thoughtful insights, tell the story. That's the experience we've sought to replicate here, and as you might expect, given the topic being explored, some of the images Jason shares and talks about can potentially be both arresting and harrowing. But arguably that's necessary if we're to understand the true impact of gun violence on some of the city's communities and residents. Telling that story visually means being truthful to this reality, and that's something Jason does with great care, both in his photography and in this demystifying media talk. Thank you. Um... First, let me start off, um, it might be informative to talk a little bit about how I got to this point in my career. Um, so real quick, I, I went to school for, um, I, I never studied uh, photojournalism, I never st studied journalism, I studied art photography, uh, filmmaking, and um, I kind of fell into photojournalism by accident. Um, I was, I was always interested in communicating visually um, and, you know, worked a little bit uh, in the film industry, just very briefly, and um, it wasn't for me. I, I, um, a friend of mine mentioned a job at a tiny newspaper in Michigan, so I applied for the job with some uh, pictures of rock bands and a portrait of my dad and um, was hired. And so I worked there for about a year, tiny little daily newspaper, a 3,000 circulation daily newspaper. I was the only photographer, there was one reporter. Um, I did everything in the building. I'd paste up pages by hand, I'd sell ads. I'd try to sell ads, I should say. <laughs> um, and just kind of learned everything on the fly. I did that for about a year and then moved to a little bit bigger paper and then a little bit bigger paper and then um, I got an opportunity for a two-year residency at the Chicago Tribune. Um, but working in those tiny papers in the middle of nowhere, um, I kind of had the luxury of not knowing too much about how a news photographer works. I had no influences um, as to like how I carry myself on assignment. Uh, you know, I, my influences were art photography, movies, things like that. But this is a tiny newspaper where I would see my subjects the next day on the street, so I couldn't, I had to portray them in a real fair way, while at the same time uh, working in this kind of fantasy realm in my head that I was making a fine art book or something. So I had to like fuse these two uh, concerns um, as, as I was developing and, and learning uh, how this stuff works. Um, you know, so at the Tribune, I, I was, um, you know, the, the first year uh, I struggled a little bit because I was trying to, um, I was trying to give them what I thought they wanted, and it just wasn't working. I wasn't able to make Chicago Tribune pictures, and um, the way the residency works, it's essentially a two-year tryout, or at the end of it, if they are not interested, you had, you know, thanks for coming, it was a great experience. Um, so the second year, I kind of, I, well, this isn't working. I need to just start taking uh, chances and swinging for the fences on every assignment. And it kind of paid off, and it kind of uh, evolved into a nice little niche there where um, I kind of was trusted to shoot very difficult assignments. Difficult, it could be difficult conceptually. It could be difficult uh, challenging aesthetically, uh, technically. And they kind of allowed me to, to push the edges of newspaper photography a little bit. Um, I got to travel a bit. Um, but mostly my work was, you know, feature-ish in nature. A lot of portraiture, um, a lot of just uh, different, different forms of photographic storytelling. And then, of course, weather photographs are, we, we have weather uh, pictures every day uh, in the paper. And this is probably the best one I'll ever shoot. Um, so I, I guess it would be instructive to talk a little bit about um, the violence in Chicago, since that's what uh, the subject matter is I'm going to discuss today. 
um, it's nothing new in Chicago. I think it's, it's something that's woven into the history of the city. There's been, in the time I've been there, 15 years that I've been there, there's been peaks and valleys. Um, but this is, this is something that is historically a part of the city. Um, and it's generally um, something that afflicts the south side and west sides of Chicago, which is almost entirely uh, minorities. Um, it, a lot of people say these, that um, the problem stems from years and years of policy, legislation, and you know, it, it's, it's a very complicated issue. The coverage of the violence in the media in Chicago, uh, to my mind, has always been very superficial. Um, you know, generally on Monday morning, you'd see the box score for the weekend. Um, you know, 35 shot, 12 dead, and weekend violence. Um, the exception to that is when there's a victim that the media perceives to be sympathetic. It could be a, like a high school basketball prospect, or it could be an honor student. And then, you know, we take photographs of the mother holding a picture of their son. But it would rarely go beyond that. And it would be sad, but nothing, you would not learn anything deeper than that. So I always felt there was more we could be reporting on that. Um, I, was, I, was, I would always be bothered in the discussions of this when I would hear, you know, like, like a, a mother on a block or a clergy in the neighborhood or a politician at City Hall talk about, yeah, this used to be a good neighborhood until these gangs came. As if, as if the gangs came down from outer space in a UFO. These are the kids in the neighborhood and maybe they're living a... Maybe they've adopted this lifestyle for a reason. Not to justify it, but I, I just want to understand it. So about five years ago, um, myself and a few other photographers agreed to form a rotation and collaborate with a new uh, breaking news reporter who came on staff, uh, Peter Nikias. Um, he was an enthusiastic uh, young reporter who was given the overnight crime shift, which is historically probably one of the worst beats you could get as a new reporter. It typically entails, um, you know, sitting at, at a desk in an empty newsroom all night long, listening to the police scanner, um, calling police news affairs, getting the police narrative, uh, typing up some notes, leaving them for the reporters in the morning. Um, he, was, he had enough curiosity to decide he was going to venture out and see for himself what this was about. And um, he, had a, he had a knack for doing it. And so we partnered with him in, into a rotation and we would alternate spending a week um, going out at about 10 p.m., putting on Kevlar vests and going to these scenes in a, as quickly as we could and immersing ourselves as deeply as we could and trying to make sense and uh, portray these scenes in a, in a visceral, honest way that could illuminate uh, what's happening and, and show uh, the residents of the other Chicago. There's two distinct Chicagos. You know, so this is, this is the city at night. This is the Humboldt Park neighborhood. This is the Woodlawn neighborhood. This is maybe half a mile from the University of Chicago. This is the Roseland neighborhood on the far south side. This is the Lakeview neighborhood and relatively affluent north side neighborhood that's not exempt from this violence. So very quickly, um, patterns would emerge. Um, we began to uh, understand the way these violent events ripple and connect people and bounce back and forth. Um, this is on the 4400 block of West Wilcox. Um, about a week or two after I made this picture, where you know the neighbors are watching this investigation, they don't seem terribly concerned, like it's anything out of the ordinary. Um, I found out that uh, a portrait one of my colleagues had made of a five-year-old boy who had been shot in the face, um, that the boy he photographed lives in this house. And then I, then I found out that this picture I had made maybe three or four weeks previously, this woman's the mother of that boy's father, 
who had just been released from prison two days before. And, you know, we started to understand uh, how this, it's not just one family, it's not just one mother, it's the entire neighborhood that's drawn into these conflicts. You know, these are detectives uh, informing this, this guy that that's his son under the white sheet. This is Omar Cassell, 16 years old, being fingerprinted in the McKinley Park neighborhood. This is him waiting for the private contractors to come remove his body. This is Cornell Square Park after, after 13 people were shot with an AK-47. The Chicago Fire Department's uh, hosing down the basketball court. The woman on the left, her three-year-old son, was shot in the face in that incident. <clears throat> Years later, I would realize that the woman on the right, we would, we would get to know her because we would encounter her at different crime scenes where it might be her friend, it might be her cousin, was involved, was a victim of these acts. I was shooting in the Canaryville neighborhood. This, the mother had, um, is confronting her son whose car got shot up. This woman had just performed CPR on her 15-year-old neighbor. You know, so I'm interested in exploring the, uh, the relationship between the police and people in the neighborhoods. Um, you know, this was a very chaotic situation that it was kind of the first time I uh, realized, um, I had realized, I had observed um, the way a crowd just responds to this, these acts in, in this kind of irrational way. And, and, and I realized they were uh, revisiting some kind of trauma, like a crowd of people, you know, from repeated ex exposure to this. Um, and then I saw it in the police and the way they were responding in this highly irrational way. I'm interested in the people who, who, whose job it is to care for these victims. And this firefighter had just uh, stopped uh, trying to revive this, uh, this man. And this woman lost uh, two sons to uh, a conflict in the, in the Brighton Park and Back of the Yards neighborhood where uh, four Mexican street gangs are uh, shooting each other exclusively with assault rifles. So this is, this is um, a little example of how the work used to be presented uh, those first two years. Um, you know, we would have a gallery online, um, and it would generally be from one incident where I might have eight to ten photographs uh, that would be interwoven with uh, Pete's words, his observations, uh, quotes from people, uh, his thoughts. And, and hopefully, if it worked right, they would complement each other with the, the photographs telling the story uh, in a way that the words can't and vice versa. So this incident was 14-year-old uh, Kevin um, Diaz. We came up and he, he looked much younger. He was laying in the parkway uncovered. And the family was just inconsolable. So the police uh, had his 17-year-old brother uh, they pulled him aside and had him come identify him because he was the, he was the calmest uh, member of his family. And then he had, to, he had to convince his mother and his family that that was, in fact, his brother. He says, they don't, they don't believe it, but I'm telling them. They showed me his face. How can it not be true? So like I said, there would you know, there would there'd be you know, 10, 10 or so pictures, and then we might include... Um, if it, if, it, if it produced itself, a uh, video that might go along with it. But I'm sorry, no, I'm not sorry. thinking about police officers. I'm talking to my children. This is what y'all want? The heck with this? Y'all doing shit. Y'all doing Do what you do. Straight A students. Straight A students. You all straight A students. Where you going? Where you going for college? Huh? Whenever. Where you going for college? Y'all both straight A students. This shit right here, y'all want? Look at they they flashlight. And I'm not identifying nobodies. This what y'all want? Cause they gonna have to scrape my motherfucking ass off the floor if that's you. You hear me? Do you hear me? Okay, y'all go. This is bullshit. The second fucking kid, remember, and nobody say nothing. Somebody seen that. 
I don't give a damn. I, I'm, I'm tired. I'm, I don't care anymore. And I'm a mother. Uh, no. No. Yes. No. Because it shouldn't be this. These are fucking kids. I've been around this bitch for five years. I can't even tell you how many kids we watched Barry. No. I'm, I don't give a fuck. I do not care. No more. This shit shouldn't be happening. If they do their motherfucking job right, and us as parents do our motherfucking job right, this shit wouldn't be happening. A fucking 15-year-old again. No. And I, I see every day. They out here on the corners. Police officers drive past. Like they don't see them. They don't see them out here in the streets. They do what they the hell they, they supposed to do. But the thing is, if a parent don't follow their lead, we fuck. And then they too busy casting catch the people who just walking down the street. But no, not, no, 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 no. I'm not going to blame you. So I will say it's not their fault. Excuse me. It's not I their am not. Fault. Uh, my name is Christine Bellacat. I am not about to blame Chicago police this time. Who no. say that? They do These their job. These fucking parents need to step yes, up. These fucking parents. You a parent. Need you to do step what you have to do, but that's it. You can't they speak for nobody else. They won't have this. You they won't have this nobody fucking else. problem. Come on. People get mad at us because we want to speak. We want to speak. You want to arrest us? You want to do everything? Cause we want to speak? No. Then, cause we gotta see that shit. And we our do. kids. And our kids. <clears throat> and our kids are scared right now. They are scared. They're, They're not scared. scared. They're not scared. All kids who don't be in those they damn be, gang of violence, they, they don't, don't be, be in there. But they should. They not scared because they used to it, and that's the problem. Yeah. So that's from the same scene. You know, we're there for hours. Where. You know, nothing's happening. We're just waiting for something to reveal itself that tells the story. This night, we happened to find something that told the story in a, in a pretty visceral way. Um, you know, they, had, they dragged their kids out of bed um, to, to see like, what ended up being their friend lying there dead in the street in a desperate attempt to scare them into going to college. So, you know, after, after maybe two or so years, it felt like we had reached a point where I think I felt like we were, I felt confident that we had successfully shown what this looks like. And it was time to show it, to, to begin to show this in a different, different kinds of ways, in deeper ways, more intimate ways. Um, my, fear, my fear was and is that if, if, it, if we continue to portray it in the same way, then it's, it ceases to help. You're, at that point, you're only uh, reinforcing the same, ser the same stereotypes. Um, so in 2015, there was an incident that <coughs> kind of horrified, shocked the city. And that was a uh, nine-year-old Taishan Lee was lured um, off of a basketball court into an alley and executed by a gang member, a rival of his father's. It was horrific. And his, his picture, his school picture was released in the media and it was heartbreaking to see this like sweet, beautiful kid and to read what had happened to him. Um, it was further complicated by um, the fact that his, of his father's uh, gang activity. Um, you know, his mother had taken the GoFundMe money that was raised and bought a car like the first week and was bragging about it on social media. And it just turned into this circus. The, there was a, a memorial forum out behind the garage and the garage was burned down. And it just, it, it kind of, the, the, the moment where the focus on this innocent boy who had been failed by every adult in his life seemed like it was, it was gonna pass without it ma without making a difference. So, uh, yep, Pete, the reporter I work with, came to me and said, look, I think we can do something more with this. At this point, um, we had a lot of contacts across the city. Um, so he started um, just reaching out to anyone we could think of who might have any kind of relation to this incident. Um, and as well as the family, and explained what our, what our motivation was and what our intentions were and that we just wanted to simply tell his story, tell the story of his final uh, journey.
gets his mother. Then that's his father in the middle. Um, the, the priest, uh, Father Flager, is a, he's kind of a well-known, fairly controversial uh, priest in the south side of Chicago. And you can just, you can see the rage on uh, his father's face. I think he's since been incarcerated. Um, so it's also, I also feel like it's extremely important to, sh to show that the people in these neighborhoods, they don't want this in their neighborhoods. And trying to explain that it's a minute uh, part of the population that is behind this violence. This is in the West Garfield Park neighborhood, historically um, a very violent neighborhood. The neighbors told us this is a, historically a very quiet block in that neighborhood. Um, but about two years ago, heroin dealers uh, set up shop here and changed the nature of the, the block. Uh, a woman said she, one day she just had enough and came out and confronted these kids and said, what are you guys doing here? Why are you on our block? And they're like, well, it's a quiet block. Um, it's a good place to do business. So these women would come out every week with uh, members of the church uh, that's the next street over and pray in the middle of the street in a desperate attempt to send a message to the, the dealers. So we, we make an effort to, when we can, um, show, the, show this response. This is after a shooting uh, in the Englewood neighborhood. This is in the South Chicago neighborhood. So another theme that uh, just continuously jumps out to me when I'm working is the idea of trying to see uh, these incidents through the eyes of the children. So this boy, this boy's cousin, Takara Morgan, was six. She was shot on the, that very porch, uh, sitting with her grandmother. So I, I can only imagine what repeated exposure to the, these uh, events uh, would do to a kid. At what point does it become normal to a kid? At what point are they drawn into this cycle? I'm also interested in what role the media plays in this. So that's, that's Takara Morgan's mother. I mean, what, it, what does it do to a community when the mirror that reflects back at you um, only reflects back this one version? Um, you know, it is, 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 the new, is the newspapers changed in the time that I've been there? Um, you know, our coverage of the neighborhoods has atrophied, and there's not much left beyond the violence. Um, it used to be, might. I might find myself taking pictures in, in a church or a school or, you know, it could be in a barber shop and restaurants in these neighborhoods. Now it's mostly violence. So in 2015, there was an incident um, involving um, a 17-year-old young man, uh, Laquan McDonald. He was high on PCP and wielding a knife. Um, and a police officer shot him as he was walking away. He shot him 16 times in about, 
I think it was about 30 seconds. And of course, it was captured on um, a dashboard camera in the police car. But the tape wasn't released for over a year, uh, leading some to speculate that uh, Mayor Rahm Emanuel had suppressed it until after uh, his reelection. Um, so, expectedly, there was outrage um, afterwards and a lot of a lot of protests. You know, so ostensibly, it's about the idea. Of, it's the, people are demonstrating the idea of um, the police brutality, but I think it also was an expression of just this uh, high level of frustration in these neighborhoods. And it was a lot of these protests were really interesting to me because they were organized by young people and they were peaceful, and it was a desperate attempt to have to have uh, their concerns and their frustrations to share them with the other Chicago. It's, it was it's kind of a rare thing. You know, these, these kids are, they're sitting in the middle of Lakeshore Drive. So in 2016, um, it kind of seemed like all these, all these factors kind of coming together. The historic uh, extreme segregation of the city, the endemic poverty in these neighborhoods. Um, you know, there, it, it, it had been about um, 16 years since uh, the second Mayor Daley uh, initiated the plan, the plan for transformation and they began tearing down uh, all the high-rise public housing that his father, the first Mayor Daley, had built you know, years and years before. So what happened was there was this population of people who had lived for four and five generations in this very unnatural condition. Um, <clears throat> about 10 years ago, um, the police went after uh, the leadership of these, these major gangs, these major uh, drug trafficking gangs, which in a weird way might have served as um, uh, controlled life in this high-rise housing and served as an economy. Um, so these people were dispersed in a, in a fairly haphazard way throughout the South Side and West Side and they didn't have gang, the gang leadership had been uh, cut off. So you had this fractured network of these gangs scattered across the city. And that drove a different kind of violence than it previously happened. The victims were getting younger and younger, and the violence was more random. It was, it was, it had lost its connection to the drug trade and was just more about this dwindling territory. Um, if this, so that dispersal uh, appears to have had the effect of uh, driving out a lot of the historical middle class African Americans who lived on the south side. And then the depopulation, there's more um, vacant houses. Um, about five years ago, Chicago Public Schools shut down 50 schools, mostly in the south and west side, which created the, the potential problem of kids having to walk through different gang territory to get to school. So that, coupled with the fallout from the Laquan McDonald shooting, and that brought increased scrutiny on the police department. And some people say that that affected the way the police were doing their job. Um, there was a Department of Justice investigation into the Chicago Police Department. All these things kind of came together in kind of a perfect storm of just really elevated homicide rates at the beginning of 2016. 
um, far higher than there had been in a decade or two. Um, so early in that year, it was also apparent that an inordinate number of children, young children, were getting shot. Um, so in discussing this with my editor, he had the idea to, that I should perhaps try and focus on those kids. We had the idea, well, maybe it would be, um, you know, portraiture of these kids and then having them tell the story in their own voice. So I spent a good part of the year trying to track these victims down, their parents, um, explaining what we were interested in. And it was difficult. I mean, they were understandably uh, fearful of uh, retribution and didn't want attention. A lot of them had moved out of the city. Um, a lot of them, maybe, you know, a half dozen I actually did photograph and I interviewed. But it didn't really amount to a whole lot until um, the fall when I met uh, Tavon Tanner. Um, he was an extraordinary young man who felt uh, urged to have his story told. He wanted to have his story told. And his mother, he has a wonderful mother, Melanie, she wanted to have his story told. I'm 11 years old. I live in Chicago. I like to play basketball and I like to play football. My summer was great until this happened. I ain't want to be like this. And, no, I ain't remember being scared. I was just getting free. I was sitting on a porch and he just came out the a vacant lot and started shooting on the porch. So I stopped because I didn't know where the shooting was coming from. Then I froze. I got down. I was ducking my head when I tried to run up in the house and I just got shot. I ain't know. Then my eyes just started closing and my twin woke me up. She started hollering, twin don't leave me, twin don't leave me. And then the ambulance came to get me. And I was on life support. That's what my mother told me, but I don't remember that. I don't remember me waking up. And the only thing I remember is asking where am I, I fell back to sleep. Then I asked where my twin. Then I asked who did this to me. I spent the rest of my summer in the hospital. And I was sad. School all right. I, I like school a lot. It's just sometimes it be bored to me and I still do all my work. I do read, math, science, and writing. I couldn't start with the other kid because an incident happened. And now, when I get three weeks of counseling, I can start with all the other kids. And I can be in school for full time. Some of that stuff hard. I know, I know all of it. I be passing some of it, but some of the stuff hard. I be trying on my own, trying to do it. I be trying to pass the class up, but I can't. I just gotta wait for the teacher. I wanna either be a nurse, a police officer, a FBI, or a firefighter. Yes. I, I want to help people out. Yeah, so what was unusual about this story was um, that it really felt like a collaboration. Um, where he, he, he had a he had a really kind of sophisticated idea that he want, in the way that he wanted he just wanted people to know what happened, and his mother did too. 
Um, I was I worked with uh, Mary Schmeek, the famous Tribune columnist on this story, and we were both very cautious at each juncture uh, in the storytelling where we'd stop and like, okay, you sure you guys are okay with this? Yeah, yeah. And to the point where uh, right before publication, Mary was going over kind of uh, some of the more provocative details to make sure that was going to be okay uh, with Melanie, they, they, just to let her know it was going to be in the newspaper. And then uh, at the very end, she, um, she said, you know, I want you to know uh, there's a very intimate, uh, beautiful picture of Tavon's body that we're going to have in the paper, and it's probably going to be on the front of the paper, and it's probably going to be huge on the front of the paper. I want you to know it. Make sure you're okay with that. And Melanie paused for a moment and said, yeah, make them see it. Um, when, when he was in the hospital, he told his mother um, that uh, when, when I get out of the hospital, I want us to start going to church. And she was like, yeah, okay. And um, a lot of the time I would spend with him, he would be, he might, he might be really withdrawn, like in that very first photo before the video, um, where he's just kind of sitting there in the dark. Um, you know, his, 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 um, his sister and cousins are outside playing or they're at school. And it really upset him that he couldn't, he couldn't start school with the other kids. Um, so he would have some really tough weeks, and then this week I went with him to church, and then after church, he was just like a regular kid again. So th this is months later, um, on the one-year anniversary of him getting shot, uh, his family decided to have a barbecue to mark that occasion. And as, as the friends and family would come over, Melanie would kind of say, yeah, I know this is weird, but you know, thanks for coming. I'm just glad we can do this at home and not at the cemetery. Um, so in all, in all of our travels through the city, um, Pete and I are continuously looking for uh, solutions, viable solutions to this, and it's rare. I mean, mostly I, I kind of feel like we were looking for these solutions just to save our own sanity, that this isn't like an entirely hopeless endeavor. Um, and uh, at a certain point we stumbled upon uh, these two guys in the Little Village neighborhood, which is a historically Mexican neighborhood. I think it's like a square mile, and it's, it's like a really nice neighborhood, Although, except for, with the exception of the fact that it's divided in half uh, with a historical uh, gang dividing line. One side is the Latin Kings, the other side is the 2-6. Describe it or explain it, you have to experience it. You have to live it. Our culture is rich, beautiful, it's very colorful as you walk and you drive down 26th Street. It's rich in many ways. Little Village, a vibrant Mexican community, man. I think to experience the beautiful part is, you know, come out on a Sunday or a Saturday morning when, you know, all in the summertime when. All the stores are open on 26th Street and come enjoy some of the food. Man, I don't know, it's beautiful, man. But also has its struggles, you know. You'll notice it when you're, you're driving into Little Village and you're leaving. There's this atmosphere around the air that's sometimes very heavy. There's an invisible wall, right, or a borderline. That, that exists here in our neighborhood and existed for 40 plus years of gang wars and the violence and, and the losing right of, of many young people and, and losing young men not just to violence but to prison. Low to middle caste families, immigration is a big issue in our neighborhood and 
think that has a lot to do about things, you know, why there's, you know, violence in the neighborhood. You know, old school Mexican, you know, families that really don't understand the dynamics of what's going on. And like in the neighborhood with like the gangs and not really, some of them maybe being naive to the fact that their kids were involved. For those of us that live and grow up in the neighborhood, you know, there's just a clear boundary. Even kids that aren't in gangs are getting shot now, man, you know? Yeah. yeah. That's the hard part about doing this work. When you have to go to a hospital with the family and you hear that from the parent, her tears and as soon as we gave her a hug, she told us he, he's, he didn't make it, he's gone, you know, her son. And so you just, just, just like there. This pain, this emptiness, and it's heartbreaking, you know. I wish we weren't having this conversation about GR that, you know, that he was still here with us, that he was still alive there. Yeah. His friends miss him, especially his family, man. His father says, man, it's hard, George, it's hard. It's hard too. Yeah, so. When I started with the Y, yeah, the red van had no stickers. It was just a big van, and we packed that van down almost every night. One time they looked at us like we were crazy because we had kids from like different parts of the city. Like, and you guys are getting along? They're like, yeah, yeah, we're going out to the movies right now. That cop is like, who are you guys? Says, George is like, my name is George Roque. And that's Benny Estrada. Benjamin uh, Estrada. He says the brother of my other mother. And so I, I see him as the, the mentor, the coach, the father. I see him as the ref, the umpire, who loves the youth here in his neighborhood. He's the Superman. When I met him, didn't think too much of him other than he was from like the other side of the neighborhood. And then uh, just struck like a friendship with him, you know? And uh, we just started talking like a little bit here and there, meet him up like at staff meetings. I kind of found out that he was trying his best to get away from all this like street stuff in the neighborhood. He was really trying to establish himself as like one of the youth workers, man. So he's an unconditional type of dude. Um, loves people at their worst. And I don't know, man, I just look at myself as a young person and uh, how hard it would have been for somebody to pull me away from the lifestyle that we were living. There's so many factors as, you know, as to why, you know, kids turn to it. I think for us it's not to judge, it's to love on them at the end of the day. To expose them to other things, I and mean, we're not telling people you need to get away from game bangers, you know? Because how are you going to get away from your dad? How are you going to get away from your brother who, you know, you've admired your whole life? And they don't even know anybody from the other side of the neighborhood. And I think, you know, for softball, it's become, the, it's become that place where you can get to know somebody that might live on Pulaski in like 26 and is in, is in love with the sport just like you. I always tell George that God has given us the relationships, you know? The trust definitely helps, for sure. And, I, you know, just us being men of our words, if we say we're going to do something, and, you know, stick to it as best as we can. Well, just come hang out. You ain't got to play. Just come coach Lino. Yeah, it takes a lot of work. Y'all be good, man. Lino's. What's up? Hollywood. look like Hollywood. Ooh, Wes? Yeah, was that Wes walking?
Yeah, so we spent two years uh, trying to get access on this story. Um, and the difficulty in that was kind of an indication that they probably were like the real deal, you know, or they had something to hide. <laughs> um, so, you know, it was this like really laborious process where um, we got to the point where they, they trusted us, but they weren't sure they wanted to have their story told. <coughs> um, mostly because uh, for them, their ability to, to do their work relies on their credibility with these kids. And they were afraid that, you know, being in the newspaper, would, they'd be perceived by these kids as selling out. Um, they just worked tirelessly on just an infinite, infinite variety of just these intangible little things to enrich the lives of these kids. That, you know, they serve as father figures to the entire neighborhood. They help these kids negotiate um, their path between the schools, the police, the gang leadership, uh, the churches, their parents. Um, and it's in this, like they said, it's in this, this very uh, unconditional, non-judgmental way um, of just, just walking alongside them. They would always talk about, yeah, like, a, like why would we tell these kids don't be in a gang? They know that. They know not to be in a gang. Um, and they don't pressure them to get out. But if they want to get out, they'll, they'll help facilitate that. And, um, but the main thing is just to show them that there's more to life than that side of Ridgeway or this side of Ridgeway. You know, this, was, this is a, a vigil for a young man who had been killed. And, you know, this kind of demonstrates um, how access is everything that we do. And getting the trust of people is, is the entire job. You know, one, of, we, one, uh, one man gave, gave us uh, his blessing and we were allowed to witness this. You know, sports is a very powerful tool that they use to give them something, you know, for one thing, just something to do, something constructive to do with their time, um, something to be a part of. Um, but then it becomes a chance to make these connections with kids from the other side of the neighborhood. Um, you know, here they're playing, they're playing football uh, in the shadow of the Cook County Jail. That's, that's where their neighborhood's located. So that's what's, that's what's reflecting back at them every day. Um, you know, so, so this project was, it was a chance. Um, it ultimately, uh, right away felt, I was a bit frustrated because after two years of trying to get access, we finally reached a point where it felt like we had kind of complete access to, we had gained the trust of the kids, we had gained the trust of Benny and George, and we gained the trust of this network of guys that, that work underneath Benny and George. <laughs> you know, they've, they've kind of created, in my mind, this, um, this mirror uh, system that kind of mirrors the way the gang works, like, like, a, like an alternate family. And, you know, my intention at the beginning was, oh, this will be a good opportunity to, to, really, to really show these kids' lives in, in, in a way that makes them understandable and relatable to the readers in the other Chicago. Um, so this was Luis uh, right after he was shot. This is Fernando. He, he had been shot in both legs uh, right before we met him, and he couldn't sleep at night. He was haunted by getting shot, so he would... During the day, George would let him come into his office and just sleep all day. You know, this is Buck, um, who we were pretty close with. Um, and this is a vigil for uh, the young man, Gio, that was shown in the video, who was not in the gang. But he was friends with everybody on his side of the neighborhood. It's, it's a very complicated thing, whether even if you're not officially a gang member, there's still going to be these connections. Um, and this is the kind of the critical moment where, you know, these guys are vulnerable 
and this is the time um, for George to intervene. You know, this is the moment where he decides if he's going to go seek retaliation. He, I, th I feel like you can kind of see um, a lot of different emotions in his eyes. This is Gio's brother. You know, again, to me this feels like he's a, this is a critical point for him. You know, so some of the mentors take these, take these guys out, drive them out of the city. They go to a grocery store to buy uh, groceries for Gio's family. You know, this, this is his burial. I'm, I still can't get over the, I'd never seen this kind of clinical dump truck at the gravesite like that. Uh, it, you know, as it turned out, Hours after they buried Gio, on the other side of the neighborhood, a young man that Benny had mentored for years, and he was confident and had gotten out of the lifestyle, was shot and killed. So it's just, you know, we had been over, it had been over a year of us spending time with these guys. No one, you know, there was no incidents. Things had really felt like they had quieted down in the neighborhood. And then just in an instant, there's this, this burst of violence. So these are Latin kings. Um, the police had just finished their investigation. These guys are just kind of milling around. It would appear to be the point where conceivably they might go uh, seeking revenge. You know, and then this is a lot of the work as George takes these guys out to the suburbs just to distract them, to give them a chance to exist outside of the neighborhood and just be kids. It's remarkable, and he always talks about how you just can't believe the minute you get them outside the neighborhood, the, this hard facade just drops, and they're these goofy kids. And, you know, this is, this is an okay photograph. Um, but what it represents is, uh, I find it very interesting. Um, so the boy in the middle is a young man, Horacio, who's from the east side of the neighborhood, George from the west side of the neighborhood. And just this warm relationship that they have is this unprecedented, unbelievable thing to people that live in that neighborhood. So this is an event they have every year, the Crosstown Classic. Crosstown referring to the other side of Ridgeway Avenue. And it's like kind of the one semi-formal chance that uh, these guys have to <coughs> interact in a kind of a peaceful, friendly way. And it's, it's interesting to me. So this was another interesting um, program, possible solution, positive thing, and we kind of, kind of, we kind of blundered into this um, through um, some of the connections we had made um, with Benny and George. So this is a program that, that a voluntary program that was taking place inside the Cook County Jail, the largest jail facility in the country, um, and you know just this guy we knew. And based on kind of the respect that um, our work and Pete's work has gotten, you know, he made some calls and we just instantly had access to this program. Um, very rare access inside of the jail. So what this voluntary program is, is um, these guys are from the most violent neighborhoods in the city. I want to say they have gun charges. And while they're waiting their trial and serving their time in, in Cook County, um, they can get counseling. They have these, these really interesting group therapy sessions. Um, they get job training. Um, I, they, they work on literacy. And the idea, just to kind of open up their minds to what the possibilities will be when they get out of the program and, and get out of, out of jail. And you know, and for me, it just was an amazing chance to 
give a glimpse into the, in these, through these intimate moments, uh, a glimpse into this world that I had never seen before. And there was one young man we were, we were speaking with who um, remarked that, you know, it's amazing that I had to get locked up to uh, have access to these, these services. So, you know, we've been doing this like five years now, and, you know, so, yes, there, there, there'll be nights where we might drive 100 miles without leaving the city, without leaving the <coughs> west side, and as we drive, you know, Pete's continuously remarking, yeah, right there's where that kid Jose got shot, yeah, right there's where we saw that other thing, right there's where those two cops shot that guy. And I let it go, like, it's like... We've created this, you know, the city of Chicago is laid out on a grid, and we've created this map of misery. And one night it kind of occurred to me um, that there was a relationship between that and this project that I had, I had uh, worked on, I had started in about 2008, um, where I was looking for a way to, a way to really have a tangible, concrete way to look at the different diverse neighborhoods of the city. Um, and the idea that I struck on was um, utilizing block parties as kind of a neutral format to, to take a look at all of the sociological information that would make up a distinct part, a distinct neighborhood of the city. So, um, people's food, their music, their dress, the architecture, the way they interact, it's all right there in the street. And it's like, it's not that weird for me to just jump out and start photographing it because it's like a special day of the year. And so I would, you know, get um, a list of permits from the Department of Sanitation, Streets and Sanitation for street closures and I'd make a list and then just, just randomly go to these places the same way we randomly go to these violent acts. And it occurred to me that this is like the inverse of what we had been doing because, you know, if, if somebody's going to go to the effort to, to do this for their block or their neighborhood, it's somebody that cares enough and wants to, you know, pr preserve life on their, on their block. And this is a point on the grid that, you know, holds the city together instead of tearing it apart. You know, this is when I, I've been to this block. Um, so every few years I go back and, and start shooting again. And this is one of the few ones that I return to. This is in the West, West Pullman neighborhood, which is, um, you know, generally a pretty, pretty crime-ridden neighborhood. But this one block is just remarkable. It's one of the nicest blocks that I found in the city. One, one of the kind of most tightly knit blocks in the city. And um, it's, just, it's, it's just a really nice place to, to visit. You know, this, this was a scene I stumbled upon where I saw everyone, you know, wearing these shirts. And as it turned out, the family was sending off um, uh, a, a young girl to uh, college. And it's important to show this stuff, to show um, just normal, um, everyday scenes from those communities as well as the other communities in the neighborhood of the city.
Okay.